I think we may start now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Tessa, as the slides say. I will be happy, just to announce, to share my slides with you. So uh, I will send an email to Marco and you will be able to download the slides. So don't feel any pressure to take photos or anything if I go through them quickly, because we have a lot to go through. Uh, this training usually takes an hour and a half and I need it to compress it into one hour. So there will be quite a quite few things which we'll uh, go, to we'll go through quickly. Uh, for the introduction, I will actually uh, use Herve's previous uh, training. Uh, he did finite volume discretization. So his training will be uh, three dots in my slide. So this is where his training goes. And uh, we'll go on from there to explain uh, the intricacies of the EFT solution uh, dictionary. So the objective and what I would like you to take with you uh, after this training is to be able to answer or at least have an idea about a couple of questions uh, which are set on this slide. So there are a few uh, words such as eigenvectors, eigenvalues, uh, residuals, smoothness, projection, positive defini po definiteness, conjugacy, preconditioning, uh, which you may be familiar with um, or you have seen it only as a word in a, in, a, in a dictionary. I will try to give my, I will give my best uh, to give an illustration of what these things, things are and how you can use them to improve your linear convergence. So let's start with a system of equations that you're all familiar with, uh, the incompressible single phase fluid flow. Um, continuity equation, momentum equation, we don't know the analytical solution, so we use uh, our uh, integral form of equations uh, in a discrete form uh, to be able to find a solution. Our solution is not an analytical function, so it's a set of uh, values, it's a field of values. Uh, and we will transform these differential operators into a linear operator and he'll, here you have an illustration of a linear operator or a coefficient matrix as I will continue uh, to call this um, huge set of coefficients. So coefficient matrix, the vector of unknowns here represented by the values of the pressure in each control volume of the mesh and the terms which belong to the right hand side vector uh, here denoted with B. I will skip the part which I usually give about the connection between uh, the spatial discretization and the um, coefficient layout uh, in the matrix. So there is, um, there is a clear connection between these two and I will leave, leave this question uh, to you to figure it out later. A few words about matrices. Um, the dimension of the matrix corresponds to the number of cells in the mesh. So the larger your uh, computational mesh, the larger your linear system will be. And the dimensions of the matrix are n times n. So equal number of rows and columns, which means that our matrices are square. Due to the discretization procedure, uh, our matrices are sparse, which means they have many zero coefficients. Uh, and only a few non-zero coefficients, coefficients in each row. These non-zero coefficients uh, form a pattern, which can be quite, uh, quite um, it can have a quite an effect on your convergence. And I will comment on this later. So just remember the pattern of the coefficients can be important. Um, our matrices are always symmetric in addressing, which means uh, that you will have the same addressing for the lower and the upper triangular part of the matrix. However, they do not have to be symmetric in coefficients. Uh, we have skew symmetric uh, or asymmetric matrices, which means that the coefficients in the upper and the lower triangular are not the same. So you cannot overlap it as a mirror. Uh, since our matrices are sparse, we will not use direct methods to solve our linear system. We'll use iterative algorithms. Iterative algorithms means that we'll get an approximation of our solution. So we'll stop iterating after we have uh, come sufficiently close to the des desired tolerance, um, which we set 
uh, to our solution value. Uh, an important definition uh, is a diagonally dominant matrix, which means that the row coefficient, the coefficient on the diagonal in a single row is larger in its magnitude than the sum of magnitudes of, of diagonal coefficients. This is important for uh, the convergence of iterative methods. However, mathematicians would likely disagree uh, with my definition, and they would say, no, no, the matrix is positive, definite, symmetric, then you can say that your uh, iterative algorithm will converge. Well, for me, I like this diagonal dominance because it's easy uh, to see whether your uh, matrix is diagonally dominant or not. Uh, these properties will give us an idea of which iterative method to choose uh, to solve our linear system in the most efficient manner. First, a couple of definitions. So I always tell my students about eigenvectors and eigenvalues. Um, with eigenvectors, there is a clear mathematical formula of what an eigenvector is. Uh, however, I like to use pictures. So an eigenvector is a special vector which belongs to a matrix, and it does not go through a rotation if you multiply it with that matrix. So what you can say is that if you apply a matrix to its eigenvector, the matrix can be replaced by a single scalar value, which we call an eigenvalue. And this eigenvalue can be larger than one or smaller than one, positive or definite, or positive or negative, sorry, uh, which will tell you how the eigenvector behaves once you have applied the matrix to it. So if you have in the upper part an eigenvector which has an eigenvalue which is smaller than one and in this case negative your eigenvector as you repeatedly apply the matrix b to it will change its direction so it will point in the opposite direction and it will shrink however it will not rotate so it will always point in the same direction um, in the second example you have an eigenvector whose corresponding eigenvalue is larger than one and positive, which means that once you apply a matrix to it, it will grow to infinity as you repeatedly apply the matrix. If you think eigenvectors are really useful uh, because if you know the eigenvectors of a matrix, you know the coordinate system which the matrix will not uh, disturb. So it will always stay the same these coordinate axes will always stay the same, which means that you can represent any vector that you like with the same, of course, dimensions as the uh, matrix space using these eigenvectors uh, and writing the vector as a linear combination of uh, eigenvectors, which is written here on this slide. Why would we want to write any vector using eigenvectors? Well, for example, we have the error. So this is the vector which we want to eliminate in order to come close to our solution of the system. So the error vector should be equal to zero if we have the exact solution of the system. And if I can write this error vector as a linear combination of eigenvectors, this means that I can monitor the components of the error and identify those which will converges slowest, so which will be eliminated uh, last. Why would, I, why would I want to know that? Well, the answer will come once we switch to the first most simple iterative procedure, which is called the Gauss-Seidel method. So this is a very simple algorithm, uh, which will be affected by the eigenvalues of the iteration matrix greatly. So gauss idel relies on decomposing your matrix into a sum of its upper, lower, and diagonal part, and then using uh, the lower or the upper uh, part explicitly. Uh, you, will, you have the algorithm written here. I will only refer, refer to the last row, where you have uh, basically written out the iteration of a gauss idel procedure. So you have on the left-hand side, the current value of the solution vector, 
And on the right hand side, uh, you have the components of the linear system, which you use to calculate this current value. And the uh, superscripts uh, above the unknown vector, i plus one and i, denote the iteration in which you're currently in, or if you're using an older value of your, of your iterand. So if you take a closer look, you will notice that in the upper uh, part of the matrix, I will be reusing old values of my uh, vector x. Um, I will skip this slide. You will be able to download it so you can really uh, write out on a piece of paper what Gauss Idle does. What I would like to go uh, to the, I would like to go to the next slide where we have a general, more general expression of these fixed point methods. Uh, so Jacobi, Gauss Idle, these are all fixed point methods. Um, where you have a matrix here, it is denoted with S, which I will call the iteration matrix. So this is a general expression of any fixed point algorithm. I is the uh, identity matrix. So this is a special matrix whose eigenvalues are all, all equal, equal to one. And it is very easy to recognize it because all its elements are set on the diagonal and they are also equal to one, so equal to eigenvalues. Uh, if we rewrite this equation in terms of the error uh, on the bottom here, you will see that um, the error of the previous iteration uh, will be in correlation uh, with the same exact error scaled by the matrix. So the goal is to get this part of the equation to become zero. So we want to eliminate the error in the uh, following step, which means that this term here should be approximately equal to the error itself. However, certain components of this error will be eigenvectors, which have eigenvalues which are very close to zero. Can you see what will happen with those components of the error? So if I multiply, this part here with the zero, it means that the error will remain the same between two iterations, or it will very, very it will um, get diminished only by a very small fraction. So these are the components which fixed point methods are not able to efficiently eliminate. And this is why their convergence stall stalls. They would converge at some point, but you would probably have to wait, wait infinitely long for that to happen. What can we do about that? So there is a way to speed up these fixed point methods by using a projection. So a projection is a special type of matrix which will keep only certain eigenvectors alive, only certain components of the error alive. What does that mean? So I will take my projection matrix, I will multiply my linear system with the projection matrix, and I will get a system which has a smaller dimension and whose uh, components of the error, so the directions which were not eliminated, eliminated, were very, very carefully filtered out. So I will only keep those ones which did not converge. Okay, and this is the basic idea of multigrid. So you will only keep the components of the error which converge very slowly, which means that multigrid and smoothing methods, so I will say later why Gauss idle fixed point methods are called smoothing methods, work together in tandem. You cannot have one without the other. Uh, here is a graphical representation of multigrid. This is a geometric multigrid concept where you have a fine mesh on the left-hand side and a coarse mesh on the right-hand side, because it was uh, noted that low frequency errors, the errors corresponding to the uh, smallest eigenvalues of the matrix are removed at a rate which is inversely proportional to the size of the computational mesh. So in order to efficiently eliminate those slow converging components of the error, you need to go to a coarser mesh. However, Meshing, trust me, and I 
sincerely hope you know, everybody knows how meshing is a bottleneck of a CFD simulation. So if I asked you to create, um, I don't know, seven uh, different densities of the same mesh, I think you would say you're crazy. So we don't want to create actual physical uh, CFD meshes. We would like to switch, switch to where the problem lies, to the algebraic linear system. So we go to the matrix itself. And here, as an introduction to uh, multigrid and how it works in tandem with the fixed point methods, I will give you a basic two-level V cycle. So in the FV solution, you have uh, one setting which says cycle, and you will choose V cycle or W cycle. What does that mean? Well, a V cycle basically tells you how many uh, or the uh, outline of fine and coarse levels that you create. So how many uh, linear systems which have smaller dimensions will I create in my multigrid cycle in order to eliminate the error in the most efficient way? We'll start with the fine level. So this is a linear system which corresponds to the CFD computational mesh that you have created, it comes from the finite volume discretization. And you will apply for example, a Gauss-Seidel algorithm. So it will say in the FP solution, a smoother Gauss-Seidel. It will eliminate the components of the error, which correspond to the largest eigenvalues, those closest to one. Remember the equation with the elimination of the error. However, some will not be affected by Gauss-Seidel. What you will do is you will create a projection operator a projection operator, a special matrix, which will then uh, which will then be multiplied with your fine level matrix, and you will get a coarse matrix, so a matrix which has fewer rows. And the creation of this projection operator, written here, depends on the components of the error that you wish to keep on the coarse level. So there is uh, a set of rules how you will recognize the directions of the error components which, which converge the slowest. And this is what is called um, a policy, if I, I'm not mistaken, in the FA solution. So it will say PAMG, GAMG, and so on. So this is the way of choosing the directions in which you will be keeping the error components, which will then be eliminated here in the course level linear system. Please notice that here we are not solving for the linear system itself. So it does not say AX equals B, but it says A times E equals R. So this is the relation between the error and the residual. The residual is the thing that we monitor to say whether our solution has converged or not. And the residual is equal to the difference between what you would get from the left-hand side of the system. So multiply A with what, whatever you have for X and calculate this product. Is it equal to B? No. So this is the residual. Well, the error tells me how far I am from my correct solution, from the solution of the system. And as, as you can say, see here, the residual and the error are connected through the matrix. So the matrix uh, multiplies the error and gives the residual, which means that the residual is equal to the error scaled by the coefficient matrix. Okay, fine level system, apply Gauss-Seidel. Some components of the error did not converge. Choose a policy which will choose the directions of the error which were not eliminated. And from that create a coarse system, so a smaller linear system. And here you will employ a direct method, which means that you will be able to accurately calculate this error term. So this is important. Here you have to be able to eliminate completely all the errors or calculate the error term for this course level system. Next step is use these corrections and apply them onto your fine system. So you will use the corrections calculated for only 
few selected equations and apply them onto all the equations in your fine system. This is again governed by the way that these directions of the uh, slow converging components of the error were chosen. So the same uh, is valid for the direction of applying the correction term. So it needs to be uh, equivalent. The effects of this multigrid cycle, mathematicians will write in a very uh, sausage-like expression uh, for a multigrid matrix. So this matrix has a very special property and it is formed by just going through this cycle and looking at what happens to this E term, the error term. So what happens is this projection, this matrix M only has two eigenvalues. One is equal to zero and the other one is equal to one, which means those components of the uh, eigenvectors multiplied by zero will be eliminated. These are the ones that gauss Zeidel can fix on the fine level. And those which are multiplied by one will be kept on the coarse level, which means that the direct method will take care of them. And you have synergy. So you have eliminated all the fast converging components with gauss Zeidel, and then you took the rest, the care of the rest with multigrid. Um, there are some intricacies with smoothing. Uh, which you will see also in your, your FV solution dictionary uh, called pre and post smoothing sweeps. What does that mean? Well, pre smoothing sweeps are uh, conducted here uh, at the beginning of the V cycle. So on your fine level uh, system. And then post smoothing sweeps are done here. After you have applied the correction, which was calculated here on the course level. And this provides symmetry of the multigrid operator, which means that this condition of eigenvalues being equal to zero and one is kept. So mathematicians would tell you that it is not wise to choose different number of pre and post smoothing sweeps. So you should have one pre smoothing sweep, one post smoothing sweep. In my experience, however, sometimes, the algorithm converges faster if you have fewer pre-smoothing sweeps and a higher number of post-smoothing sweeps. For example, one here and three here. Uh, I tried increasing a bit more to three, but it didn't show uh, much benefit. So my recommendation is one, three or two plus two, two pre-smoothing, two post-smoothing sweeps. Different types of cycle exist. Uh, in form, we ha have V and W. And also the complexity of our CFD problems, its size, its dimensions, means that usually a two-level cycle is not enough. So it is not enough. It is not quite sufficient to have only a fine and a coarse level, but you will have multiple coarse levels. So you will start with your fine level, which corresponds to the discretization coming from your computational mesh. And then you're, you'll create a hierarchy of course level problems, which will go to the coarsest one, which can be solved with a direct method. The problems, the linear problems in the levels which are in between the finest and the coarsest can be solved with iterative methods. So this is also a way of gaining some speed up. So direct method will only be used on a coarsest uh, courses level. Another option is a W cycle, uh, which means that you will spend some more time on course levels uh, before uh, getting back to the fine uh, level. And there is also what we call a full multigrid cycle, where you will go actually from the coarsest level and uh, work your way up to the finest one. A few words about algebraic smoothness. Uh, however, I, ha I have given uh, quite a few information already. So the error term, which is, not, which is not efficiently removed by the fixed point methods can be described with this equation. So the, um, this is a basically a linear system, as you can see, but all the linear system, which consists of the error being the vector and it is equal to zero. So this is the equation where we, where we start from. And this is the equation 
which we use to formulate the interpolation. The interpolation is important in this part and in this part. So interpolation will tell you how you will create those projection operators. And using some um, mathematical um, insights into the structure of the matrices. So these matrices, which mathematicians have looked into are usually very nice matrices. So positive definite symmetric, but they were able to do to draw some conclusions from looking at these matrices and to develop a reasoning for creating interpolation. So one of the uh, most efficient uh, multigrid method is, methods is the so-called classic algebraic multigrid. Uh, in form, we have the abbreviation SMG, uh, selection algebraic multigrid, uh, which is somewhat more expensive uh, than the method which uses clusterings, uh, clusterings of equations. Uh, different abbreviations are used, AMG, PAMG, GAMG, depending on how this clustering uh, is done. Um, visually, AAMG, PAMG, GMG means that you are trying, if you're looking at your computational mesh, you're trying to achieve a more uniform computational mesh by adding the equations up. So uh, finite volume discretization by its nature depends on the volumes and face areas of your computational cells. And if you employ uh, clustering methods, it means that you're actually trying to create cells, which are virtual, they do not exist, uh, but some equations on the course level exist, which represent larger clusters, which we can imagine as being cells. And if it, you take a look at the effect, it means basically that you're making your mesh more uniform and this improves convergence. So whenever people ask me, what should I do with my FE solution? Nothing works. So I have a recipe book, try this, try that. What, sh what should I do? Take a look at your mesh because the mesh can greatly affect the convergence of the linear system. If you have a beautiful mesh, you shouldn't have problems with your FV solution dictionary. So it should uh, work. The selection method is somewhat more complicated because it's using the previous equation for the uh, algebraically smooth error. What does algebraically smooth means? It means that you have, imagine a smooth function. So you're trying to find the directions in which the function is smooth. So you can smoothly, you can represent it um, on a coarser uh, outline of points. So selection, somewhat more expensive, uh, but converges better uh, for meshes, which are more challenging. So I would recommend using it for more complex problems. Regarding the choice of smoothers, so I have mentioned gauss seidel and uh, Jacobi as being the fixed point methods uh, which are used. However, uh, in our research, we have found that uh, incomplete lower upper factorizations of the matrix also have smoothing properties. And for example, for block matrices of different uh, types of equations being combined in a single linear system, we always use this L, uh, ILU factorization as the smoother. Uh, it works better in a sense that it converges while gauss seidel does not converge. This was multigrid. So multigrid um, is a complement to the fixed point methods. However, it is rarely used as a standalone solver. Usually it is combined with what we call Krilov subspace methods. So this lecture should actually be div divided into two parts. And the first part is multigrid or using projection to eliminate certain slowly converging components of the error. And the second one is shifting your perspective on the linear system completely. We're not looking at the linear system anymore as the, as the uh, AX equals B, but we will look at it as a minimization problem. 
So what I will do is I will create a function from the components of my linear system. Here is the function, and it is called a quadratic function. Here you will easily identify all the components, the unknown vector x, the coefficient matrix A, the right-hand side vector B, and there is an arbitrary constant which we can just say uh, it is equal to zero. So uh, just eliminate that from the equation. If I have a system which is very small, two by two, so only two unknowns, I can draw this quadratic function. So here you have an example of two quadratic fu functions of two separate linear problems. The axis of this uh, graph are the value of the components of our unknown vector. So it has two components, one and two, and the value of this corresponding function. And as you can see, it has a very nice bowl-like shape. On the other side, you have, uh, again, a quadratic function, and now it is a ball turned upside down. Why is that so? Well, we need to take a look at this leading term of our quadratic function, which is actually the definition of what a positive definite matrix is. So a positive definite matrix is characterized by this leading term being greater than zero. And visually, it means that its quadratic function looks something like this. So this is a ball, a quadratic function, which looks like a ball. Uh, is a, we corresponds to a system which has a positive definite matrix. This guy here corresponds to a negative definite matrix. So you can easily get a positive definite matrix bar by negating uh, a negative one. Also, we can represent this quadratic function by using isocontours. So imagine if I uh, had a camera up here on the slide and I was viewing the quadratic function from above, I would be able to draw lines which connect the areas which have the same value. And it will look something like this. So now I have shrunk my 3D representation into a 2D representation where we have, again, the same uh, axis. So components of our linear, uh, of our unknown of the linear system. The curious thing is, you can see that this shape has a clear minimum, right? It has a single point which corresponds to only one value. So there is not a line, there is a dot. And also on the right-hand side, the arrows here, uh, just to make clear, represent the eigenvectors corresponding to the matrix of the linear system. What can happen if our matrix is neither positive definite nor negative definite, where it has to be something, right? So it can be one of the following. We have a shape which resembles a piece of paper, which has a very long line stretching down the minimum. And we can have something which resembles a saddle. So this representation here corresponds to an indefinite matrix which means there is no clear minimum to this shape. And the saddle point also has no clear minimum nor maximum. So if we have an in indefinite or a saddle uh, point linear problem, this means that we cannot look at our linear system as a problem of minimization. So what we are trying to do here is transform a linear system into a minimization problem and employ a method for looking at a minimum of a function to find the solution of the linear system. Because curiously, this dot here, this point here, what do you think it represents? It represents exactly the components of the solution vector of our linear system. So this is the solution of the component x1, and this is the solution of the component x2. So if I find the minimum of my quadratic function, which is assembled from the pieces of my linear system, I will find the solution of the linear system. 
How do we find the minimum of a function? This is what, high school? So we find the point where the gradient of the function is equal to zero. And if you have, if you're lucky enough, you will have a symmetric positive definite matrix. So positive definite means it has a clear minimum. And symmetric means that you can find the gradient of the quadratic function. And this gradient will be quite familiar. Ax minus b. This is the residual, although negative. So b minus ax is our convergence criterion. This is what we look at when we say, okay, my linear system has converged. I'm satisfied with the approximation of my solution. So in order to find a solution, the minimum of quadratic function, I need to find the point where the gradient of the quadratic function is equal to zero. And this uh, expression here coming from the uh, fact that my matrix is symmetric is actually equal to the residual written here on the bottom. We have mentioned before that error points, uh, points out how far I am for the exact, from the exact value of my solution vector, while the residual indicates how far I am from the vector of the right-hand side if I insert some intermediate value of x into my linear system. And I have also told you that the residual is actually equal to the uh, error scaled by the coefficient matrix. More importantly for CG, so for uh, our minimization problem, uh, the residual is actually the direction of steepest descent. Because if you think about the, the gradient, the gradient at any point of this quadratic function will point in the direction in which the function uh, has the greatest slope. Okay, so this is where the residual will point, which means that whichever point I choose and I calculate the value of the residual in this point, so this is my solution guess. I'm guessing the solution. Let's say it is here. I can calculate the residual and it will give me a feeling, a sense of where, where my function decreases which means that I can use the residual as the direction for searching the minimum. So use the residual of the linear system to be able to find the minimum of your quadratic function. And this means that you have found the solution to your linear problem. A, line, a line search is a procedure used to calculate how far we should step in the direction of this residual. But let me make a quick um, digression from this. I have told you that every linear uh, or every matrix has a distinct shape of this quadratic function. So whether it's a ball, whether it's a saddle point, however, this ball does not have to be perfectly round. So it can be a bit more stre stretched in one direction or the other. And this depends on the value of eigenvalues of my matrix. So if your matrix has very, very different eigenvalues, so for example, if we have a two-dimensional matrix and one is much larger than the other, this means that your ISO contours will be stretched. Imagine as if you drawn a circle on a piece of bubble gum and started stretching it one direction. So this is what happens. A question to think about, what is the matrix which has a perfect circle? The identity matrix. So the matrix whose eigenvalues are all equal to one. The quadratic function has isocontours which are perfect circles, which means that if you calculate the gradient at any point and you make a step along this gradient, you will find your solution in a single step. So identity matrix is something that we're really longing for in this minimization problem. If your matrix is very close to the identity matrix, it, it means that you will have very few iterations of your minimization procedure until you have 
reach their final solution. If you have a more stretched quadratic function, which means that the eigenvalues are different in magnitude, this minimization procedure will take quite a few steps. This is called the steepest descent method. So what you're basically doing is you're doing a line search along the direction in which the gradient points along the, your residual. And once you're, you reach a point where your function starts increasing, you stop there. And then you do another search in the direction of the residual. However, this is not very good for matrices which have very different eigenvalues because it will make the algorithm step in the same direction multiple times. So what we should do is we should make these directions orthogonal. So we should only step in a single direction once. And this means if I have a two by two system, how many iterations do I need to converge? Two, because I will re remove first one component and then the other. It's only two steps, which means that you have limited yourself to a feasible number of operations. Now let's think again. CFD problems. I don't know, a mesh 50 million cells. Do you want to wait 50 million linear iterations to get to the correct solution? I wouldn't. So definitely steepest descent is completely uh, unusable because you don't know how many iterations it will produce. However, we have a method of making the, the search directions orthogonal to one another. And this means that we need to step in a single direction only once, which, which has limited our number of steps to the dimension of the linear system. Still not good enough. There is an answer. Instead of making your search directions orthogonal to one another, you will make them conjugate. So now CG conjugate directions uh, C or conjugate gradients comes to uh, play. Conjugacy means that this product here, this, this can be any vectors. So D, D, let's say D, A, D equals zero. So a triple product of two vectors and a matrix is equal to zero, which means that these two vectors are conjugate. Again, go into the uh, bubblegum example. This means that if you draw two orthogonal vectors in our Euclidean space, and you have done that on a piece of bubblegum, and you start stretching it, this means that you have performed a linear transformation of your space. These two vectors are no longer orthogonal when you look at them. However, they are orth a orthogonal or conjugate. So conjugacy or a orthogonality, where a represents the matrix, means that your vectors are orthogonal in the space stretched by your matrix. And this proved to be very useful. I will uh, skip the details because they're quite tedious. Because they, you have a couple of advantages. First of all, you do not have to calculate n different directions, which are all orthogonal one to another. Because imagine the amount of memory you should uh, have available for storing such a large number of vectors. So you should store each direction to make sure that every subsequent one is orthogonal to previous ones. This is what actually is done in a, a linear solver called GMRES. So this is where you have to specify the number of directions which you will save. In CG conjugate gradients, you are blessed because you have the residual and you have symmetric positive definite matrix. So this is a condition of uh, convergence for CG. CG will converge only for positive definite symmetric matrices. Okay, symmetric, that's very important. And it will employ residuals and the property of conjugacy to reach the solution in only a few steps or an approximation 
a good enough approximation of the solution. Because CG, uh, by creating A orthogonal directions and employing residuals to do so, first, does not need to store any previous directions because the residuals, the residual has the property that it is already orthogonal to all the previous directions. And you can use the residual to create a orthogonal search direction here, which is actually parallel to your error vector. So this is a graphical representation of CG. So error, the thing that we want to eliminate is parallel to the search direction created from the residual at any given assumption of the solution, which means that CG by stepping in that direction eliminates one error component per iteration. Why do we need to run only a few iterations of CG in order to reach an approximation which is good enough? Because the largest components of the error get eliminated the first. So this is a very, very beneficial algorithm. You're eliminating the largest components of the error first, which means that you can stop the iterative procedure after only a few steps, a fraction of the steps compared to the problem size and have a solution which is good enough. So the approximation of solution which is good enough for you. What if you are not blessed with a symmetric positive definite system? Well, there are some other uh, algorithms which are based uh, or which are inspired by this. Uh, method of minimization. First one, GMRES, generalized minimal residual. So also a process which relies on minimization. However, since the matrix is asymmetric, we do not have the property of residuals being, being orthogonal to previous search directions, which means you need to store all directions uh, in which you have already eliminated the error in order to make sure that the subsequent one is orthogonal to the previous ones. So there is a memory overhead compared to this CG algorithm. Then we have uh, two more general algorithms, uh, BICG and BICG stub. Um, BICG operates on a transpose and the original matrix of the linear system. However, it did not prove to be uh, applicable to our a large sparse problems. So we use PACG stub instead. Um, to be honest, I have read perhaps 10 books with linear algorithms and I still do not understand BICG stub completely. So there are some polynomials, some coefficients, some smoothing properties, um, and it has a very oscillatory behavior and it requires something called a preconditioner, which will be our next topic, preconditioning. So just to give a quick summary, uh, because it's late in the afternoon and we've had lunch, so we are sleepy perhaps. Um, first part of the lecture was a brief overview of fixed point methods, very easy algorithms, which can be um, which can be used and um, actually programmed Gauss Idol uh, during my second year of um, college or faculty or during the faculty. So because it's, it's, it's very easy and it's, uh, it's a nice algorithm uh, to practice your programming skills because it's very simple. Uh, it's very simple numerics. Uh, however, it has a drawback that it will only eliminate uh, some components of the error and the other ones you will have to wait for a very long time to be eliminated. We employ multigrid, so it is a projection method where you will only keep those uh, components of the error which uh, Gauss Idol is not able to remove and you will eliminate them by using a direct method. So this is a tandem of so-called smoothing algorithms and multigrid. And then we shifted to another uh, perspective on the linear system being a minimization problem where you will represent your linear system by using its components as a function, which needs to be minimized. So you need to find the minimum of the function. 
and accidentally the minimum of this function is the correct solution of your linear system. However, I have mentioned that if you have the unfortunate of having different eigenvalues, and I will comment on that in the summary uh, of your coefficient matrix, you will have uh, a problem which is very slow to converge. So the idea is to have a matrix which is very close to identity, whose quadra quadratic function looks like a perfect round ball, because then you can have only one iteration and bam, you're there to the final solution. So idea of preconditioning is changing this shape of this ball to be more round. How do we do that? So we want to take a matrix which we have and transform it to an identity matrix. Well, I can calculate the inverse, multiply the two matrices, the inverse and the original matrix, and I will get the identity matrix, correct? How expensive is it to calculate the inverse of a matrix, of a sparse matrix? Too expensive, that's the answer. It's too expensive, which means that we need to have a simpler and cheaper and yet effective way. Preconditioning. So what we'll do is we'll find an approximation of the matrix as close as we can get to the original one, but it needs to be very easy to invert. So it need, needs to be easy to invert. And then after I have calculated this um, inverse value, I hope that it is close enough so that the product of the two matrices will be very close to identity, which means that my CG will converge in only a few iterations to the final and correct solution. So how do we choose a method for calculating this preconditioning matrix, this approximation of A, which is very easy to invert? So this, these are the conditions. And there are a couple of uh, algorithms uh, which can be used to calculate this approximation. I will skip this. These are the details of left and right preconditioning, um, which you will see in open form. So for example, diagonal preconditioning, what does that mean? It means that you take the original matrix and you only keep the diagonal coefficients of this original matrix. And once you invert it, what do you actually do? You calculate the reciprocal value of diagonal coefficients, that's it. And you multiply the two matrices. So it is explicitly done. You multiply the diagonal matrix with the original uh, matrix of the system to create something that is perhaps a bit better uh, for our methods uh, to be more efficient. However, this diagonal or Jacobi preconditioning has a few drawbacks. First is that it can um, take a symmetric matrix uh, and the matrix will not be symmetric any longer if you're not very careful. So you're losing symmetry, which is not good because CG cannot be applied to unsymmetric matrices. A more complex method uh, which preserves symmetry is the LU uh, factorization. We have mentioned that already in the, uh, in the case of smoothing properties. So lower upper factorization creates two factors, a factor which only contains the lower triangle and a factor, a matrix, which contains only the upper triangle. Creating the exact LU factorization of a matrix, which is sparse, is again too expensive in terms of number of operations, memory overhead created, and so on, because you likely expect a, a sparse matrix to produce densely populated factors, L and U. We want to avoid that. So what we use is the so-called incomplete ILU, incomplete lower upper factorization, which has different strategies on how this incomplete word is defined. So you can either um, choose to preserve the structure of the original matrix. So you'll only calculate the factorization and the elements which will appear 
at the spots at the addresses of the elements of the original matrix, no memory overhead. However, this can cause a few problems with convergence because likely you will drop uh, some important uh, elements which would appear in the uh, exact LU factorization. Another way is using a threshold. So you will calculate the elements and you will compare them to a threshold value. And those who are above the threshold will be kept. The drawback of that method is that you do not know in advance how the elements, the coefficients of the matrix uh, will be distributed throughout. So this is something which is, you do not know how, how much memory you should uh, reserve for this factorization. The effect of preconditioning. So on the left-hand side, uh, quadratic function of a symmetric positive definite matrix. And you have uh, the black arrows, which correspond to the eigenvectors uh, with the, with the uh, eigenvalues uh, written as well. And here, I don't know if you can read out, I will read it out. One eigenvalue is 10.2 and the other one is 1.24. So almost 10 orders of magnitude, uh, one order of magnitude. And you can see how the elliptic, uh, the quadratic function is becoming more elliptic. It is stretched because of this difference in eigenvalues. After preconditioning, so applying a diagonal preconditioner, you will get a more rounded shape. However, look at the eigenvectors. They are no longer orthogonal. See that? Which means that the matrix that you got is no longer symmetric. And this is a problem for CG. Another way of illustrating preconditioning is by drawing the Gershgorin theorem. This one I like. So the Gershgorin theorem tells you um, about the eigenspectrum, so where your eigenvalues of the matrix are located, by only using the values which are written in your coefficient matrix and summing them. So there are, there's, there are no complex mathematics behind this. So what does the uh, Gershgorin theorem say? That the matrix can be represented by a set of circles. Each circle has the center, the center corresponds to the, the value of the diagonal element of a matrix row, while the radius of the circle corresponds to the sum of magnitudes of, of diagonal coefficients. And the Gershgorin theorem says that your eigenvalues will be clustered inside of these circles, inside of these disks. So you can get a sense of whether your eigenvalues are spread out or they're more clustered together, which is a nice thing to have because this means that your eigenvalues are more close in value one to another. And here's the effect of preconditioning. So the original one, two black circles. So again, you see one eigenvalue is equal to 10.2 and the other one, 1.24. And after preconditioning, we have two red circles. So they have uh, bumped one to, into the other which means that your eigenvalues are more clustered together. Uh, note on convergence criteria. So the residual that you get in your log files, in your uh, report on the convergence, are not the exact values of residual. So it is not R equals uh, A X minus B, but they are normalized. Why are they normalized? Well, imagine, I don't know, probably you have many different uh, models and uh, physics problems which you're solving, and they have solutions which are very different uh, in terms of the orders of magnitude of your solution values. So if you had a residual with, which told you uh, a value of 10, and then you had a residual which told you 10 to the power of minus two, and it's not normalized, so it's an exact number, it's quite difficult uh, to interpret. So what we do is normalization, which is done by this nice formula here, uh, which actually implies uh, a mean value of your uh, current solution. So a mean value of your current solution, which means that you will get uh, more or less uh, values of residual, which can be compared one to another throughout the iteration procedure. And you will have a better sense of where you actually are uh, in terms of convergence. 
relative tolerance and tolerance, um, just to remind you, relative tolerance compares the initial and the final residual uh, of your linear iteration. So it will say, okay, if your linear algorithm, your AMG has successfully managed to lower the residual five orders of magnitude, you will stop uh, the iteration process. Uh, or you can set um, tolerance, uh, which would be um, not, not, a, not a relative tolerance, so an exact tolerance for the final residual. I wish my iterative algorithm to converge to the residual, normalized residual value of 10 to the power of minus six. And it will uh, use the available number of uh, iterations which the user has provided. Before we go into the summary, we have two minutes. I skipped something which I think uh, could be nice, a condition number. It was the condition number. So the residual does not have to be a good measure of convergence or of the error term. Why is that? Remember when I told you that the residual and the error are connected by this equation here. So the error is, uh, the residual is equal to the error scaled by the coefficient matrix. If your coefficient matrix has eigenvalues, which are very different in magnitude, 10 and one, some components of the error will be multiplied by this very small eigenvalue and some components will be multiplied by a very large eigenvalue, which means that the residual can be really giving you a wrong idea, a wrong sense of how large the error term is. And this is defined, these problems uh, are defined by the matrix condition number, which is the ratio of largest to smallest eigenvalue. Ideally, it should be equal to one. So there is no difference between the smallest and the largest, which means uh, that the error is well represented by the residual. So just have in mind, small residual does not have to imply a small error. And in the end, a summary, um, the matrices which arise from the finite volume method are sparse uh, due to the discretization procedure, and they depend greatly on the mesh structure because we're looking at uh, the volume of the cells, the face area of the faces, um, and other geometric properties of the mesh. And the choice of the linear solution algorithm always depends on the properties of the coefficient matrix in terms of whether your system has a symmetric matrix or asymmetric matrix, whether it's positive definite or not. And I have already given a summary of what these basic fixed point methods do, how they work together in tandem with multigrid, and another perspective on the linear system as being a minimization problem uh, where we use the benefit of, again, matrix properties uh, to help ourselves a little bit with the uh, most efficient convergence. Uh, the slides will be provided. Uh, I'm very happy to have you in such a large number. And if you have any questions, I will answer them now or just grab me during the coffee breaks if you want uh, a longer discussion on something. Thank you very much. Um, I want to know, um, obviously there's a lot of uh, uh, solvers with smart grid implemented. So in the open form wise, uh, there's also passive form in there inside. Do you have any in in insight about uh, scalability wise, say your implementation compared with uh, like PETI based uh, algebraic smart grid? Um, thank you for the question. I actually haven't compared PESI myself, but I have seen a few papers which compare uh, the two. And I don't think it's even, uh, it's not fair to compare uh, a library which was written for a specific matrix format. Uh, so. In OpenFOAM, we actually have a project going on called ExaFOAM, where we try to determine the optimal matrix uh, structure and storage format to be able to make uh, these algorithms scale 
linearly or better than that. Uh, for now, of course, Petsy scales better. It's, uh, I don't think uh, we can even compare it, uh, but we are working on changing uh, the data structure to be competitive. So it's a, it's a very good question because it, it opened a, a whole project Thank you. and a team of people working on it. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so you uh, avoided the uh, the negative definite matrices, right? To solve it. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a method to transform into another type of matrix and solve it, or it's just a uh, lost cause? Uh, well, negative definite matrices would have the minimization problem switched around to maximization problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's uh, it's not um, it's not a problem that should be set. It's not a problem which which should be avoided uh, because there are methods which we can efficiently use. We have a very very uh, clear solution in a negative definite system. Uh, you have problems with indefinite and saddle point systems, so there are preconditioning methods for that, uh, and uh, we employ them actually in foam, but this would be another one hour lecture, so. Okay, uh, and, and another one, uh, which solvers do you think would help in uh, multi-phase flows where they have a large condition number? Right. Uh, multi-phase flows, well, guys at the faculty um, use the the available solvers which are provided in the library as I, as far as i know um so conjugate gradients or krilov subspace bacg stub uh, i don't know how i think herb knows how multigrid was uh used for the uh, interface between the phases so with selection uh, algorithm i could see a few issues there but i think it's also uh implemented in some in some way. Okay, thanks for your answers. Can... Thank you very much, Tessa. It was a very interesting presentation. I'm going to ask what's probably a dumb question. I'm aware I've got her sitting right <laughs> behind me. Um, one of the big challenges in CFD is using GPU computing. Is there anything we can do at the matrix level, basically at this level, which would make use of GPU, the, the strengths of GPUs? So um, massively, enormously massively parallel computing, basically. I don't know if anybody here is sitting from the Exafone Consortium. Uh, we have a project going on exactly on employing GPUs. Herb. Thank you. Let me take it one question back. So there was a question about what to do with free self where we have a big jump in the coefficients. Mm -hmm. So Vuko and I about three years ago were very optimistic about it and we implemented the coarsening method in selective AMG, which made sure that you don't coarsen across the interface. And that sounds so appealing and it was so rubbish. Okay, so if you want to have a go, that coarsening algorithm still exists somewhere. It is clustering rather than selective AMG. But with selective AMG, you should get those coefficients knocked out because of the strength of coefficients anyway. That's true. So my answer is, we tried, we did something wrong, and the answer was exactly the opposite from what we expected. And it got put on the shell. Thank you. Okay, and if you allow me for the second answer as well. Okay, so there is a group at Exafoam uh, who is looking at formats of matrices that would really help, but this is generic HPC. And in Zagreb, we have Mate, who is not here. Mate yeah. is there, looking at preconditioners that we could use on 100,000 CPUs, but he still didn't put his PhD on my desk. So I don't know what the answer is. There is the uh, presentation on Wednesday. 
Thursday, sorry. No pressure, huh? No pressure. <laughs> okay. But to answer Gavin, okay, so I have been worrying a lot about this issue of everybody else is using GPUs. And there is an interesting answer, okay? So the interesting answer is that with the GPU, you cannot use indirection, okay? So you can't have face addressing. And what you can have instead is a banded matrix. So the format that I would recommend for GPU is A, don't move just the solver onto the GPU, move everything onto the GPU. B, take the big mesh and renumber it to squeeze the band and then do a band field matrix to do what we need to do, okay? And that basically means just changing the looping structure and keeping all the operators as they are. But by doing that, we could do both matrix assembly and matrix solution on the GPU, which is at least one generation in front of Fluent, okay? And the third thing is, what happens if you have a hundred million cell mesh and then some bits of the band are too big and you can't renumber? And what I was consider in that case is basically say, well, I don't care. That coefficient will going to be made explicit. We'll move it into the right-hand side and hope for the best. Okay, but this is a serious project. It requires renumbering and I would like to see it tried in uh, Robert's own Python code, because there we could afford to rewrite the whole of the discretization and see how it works. Okay, Gavin, happy? Do you want the mic back? I think we're Thank running you. out of time. Yeah, I want for follow-on questions. Given uh, we are talking GPU, we're, we're talking about all like uh, maybe future heterogeneous architectures. Um, one or key advantage, I think, open form is that we use C plus plus language, and as as you know, C plus plus also have a wide effort for supporting heterogeneous uh, computing. So in that sense, to, from open form to from source code development standard, are there any plans, say, try to take in advantage well, from latest C++ standard, trying to also inco inco incorporating heterogeneous parallelism into open form? I don't know. So I think you got yourself a job here. We have the Exaform project. There are people talking about GPUs. There are people looking at heterogeneous platforms. My C++ stopped at about C++ 17. And what I found is if I use the C++ 17 compiler, it's five times slower than the C++ 14 compiler. And I'm a busy man. I'm also an old man. So please look at Tessa and Mate and uh, Robert and other people in the room because the answers are with them and not with me. Thank you. Any other questions? I hope not. That's it. Thank you, Tessa. Thank you.